Tool calling is a fundamental concept in building AI agents. I'm gonna be going over why it's needed in the first place, what it actually does, and how to integrate it in your own applications. I'm also gonna be talking about how it works in the OpenAI API, and I'm also gonna talk about how to integrate it with Model Context Protocol. Let's jump right into it. Okay, so if you take a look at my screen here, I've got this directory on the left-hand side, it's called Funder. And in Funder, I've got two text files and a .sh file. So the text files, we just say stuff like hi, we say bye, and there's also a file called run.sh, which is actually going to run a bash script. Now let's pretend that I didn't know what was going on with this directory, and let's pretend that I wanted ChatGPT to help me with figuring out where the executable was in this directory. Maybe you could do something like this. So I have a few prompts for us here, and as you know with ChatGPT or AI, you're always gonna be using a prompt. If we go over here, here's the first prompt that I've cooked up for us. It says, I have a directory, and then there's the full path, what files within this directory are executable? So let's actually go over to ChatGPT and copy and paste it and see what comes out. Okay, and so unsurprisingly, it has no idea what files in my directory are executable or not. It's giving me some tips on how I might be able to figure that out, but ChatGPT itself is an application, but the underlying language models themselves, LLMs, they have no way to execute code, to run functions, do anything like that. All they do is predict the next token. How could we help ChatGPT here? How could we get it into a position where it could actually answer my question? What if we do something like this? Let's go to another prompt. So as you guys may or may not know, I could just run an LS on my directory myself. So I could just do, for instance, LS-LAH and do funder. And here's the output here. So we can see uh, just by looking at the output, there is no executable bit on run.sh. So actually none of the files are executable, even though run.sh has the .sh extension. But pretending I didn't know that, we could actually ask ChatGPT to do the exact same thing, but this time provide it the output from LS, giving it a little cheat sheet. So let's copy and paste that. We're gonna start a new conversation and now we are going to ask ChatGPT the exact same thing. And now it's telling me based on the output, none of the files are executable, which is what we were saying before. Giving ChatGPT notes here, allows it to actually answer our question with confidence because now it sees what's going on in our system. I had to know to actually go and run LS and I had to know to copy and paste the output back into ChatGPT. What if we could do something a little better here? What if we could actually have ChatGPT let us know that LS is what we have to do? Like what if ChatGPT could actually facilitate this entire debugging cheat sheet process? So let's actually go in and look at a file that I wrote. It's called tools.ts. And we've got a file called tools.ts here. So this is a very simple TypeScript file. If we take a look here, it's only got one function. It's called ls. And the arguments to this function are just the path that you want to ls. And the output is going to literally just be the standard out output from the ls subprocess. So if we go ahead and run this, so I'm running it on that path. So this is pretty much just going to run ls on a subprocess. If I run this code here, we see that the object returned has one field. It's called ls underscore stir and it's got the output that we saw there. So that works relatively straightforward. And if we look up here, I actually added a comment that includes some details about how the function works. So nothing fancy here. This is a very straightforward function, nothing very special. But what if we told ChatGPT something like this? What if we said, hey, you're a helpful assistant, try to be as helpful as possible with the user, but you also have the following tools available. And I'm giving it information about this tool. So I'm kind of embedding the details of this function and I'm letting ChatGPT know, hey, this is a tool that you're actually able to call. This is something that you can tell the user to do on your behalf. And if we take a look here, I added four things about this tool. I've added the name, so it's called LS. I've added the args interface. So I'm telling it, how do you actually invoke this tool? What arguments do you need to pass in? And I'm also giving it the response shape. So I'm telling it, this is what you're going to be returned when this function is called. And then also I'm giving it a description. So this is something in English, a human readable description of what's going on in the tool. And you'll notice that I took the description, I, I, I ripped it straight from this comment here. And so I'm telling it about this tool. And then I'm also telling it, hey, if you need to call a tool, I'll put a JSON that looks like this. So, I'm, so instead of ChatGPT telling me in English, hey, I'm not able to do that. I need you to call this tool. I need your help. It's literally just going to output a JSON object and it's gonna have the name of the tool and then also the arguments. And we'll see why this is useful later. And then at the very end, we actually have this user request. So what I'm trying to get ChatGPT to do here is de determine on its own that it needs more information and determine based on the available tools that it has that it's able to actually use one to unlock the hidden information. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this. Go back over to ChatGPT, copy. Let's see if it can do this. Okay, and so it did output a bunch of crap here that we probably wouldn't want, but you'll notice that the first thing it output 
was actually this object here. We can actually copy and paste that JSON directly back into the code and then call the function. And now that we have the function output, what we could do is actually go in here and give it to ChatGPT. And here's the output of the tool call. And now it's saying, oh, well, now that I see the output here, none of the files are executable. Now we're getting that same answer from before. So fundamentally, prompt two and prompt three are relatively similar. They work better than prompt one because we're actually giving ChatGPT the information that it's need, that it needs. But in prompt two, I had to know myself that I had to go into LS. I had to know that that was something I needed to do and I needed that output to be provided to ChatGPT. In prompt three, I actually didn't give it any of that information. I'm telling ChatGPT the sort of stuff that it's allowed to do. It's kind of like phone a friend in a game show. It, if it doesn't know something, but it knows a friend that it can call, in this case, the LS friend, and it knows the phone number, the arguments, and, and what LS friend is going to tell it, it's able to do that. So that's the idea with tool calls, is you give the language model not just the user's request, but you also give the language model a list of things that it can call. And because the language model will be told for each tool, the types of arguments that it has, the types of response information that it will provide, and, and crucially, the description of the tool, the LLM will know how to get itself out of a jam because it can execute a tool call. Like we talked about before, LLMs, and in this case, ChatGPT, they don't actually have any of this code. Like nowhere on OpenAI servers are they going to have this TypeScript code that I wrote here. And so they're not actually able to execute the tool on my behalf. I actually have to execute the tool on ChatGPT's behalf. And so these tools here, they only work if you actually have a proper function that's running real code to execute the tool. It's not just something that can be made up or built on the spot. You actually need to have these tools implemented for ChatGPT to use them. And so what you would do if you were writing an application is you would grab the response from ChatGPT, detect that it called the tool, and then you would actually go into your code and in this case, invoke the LS function, grab the output of the LS function, paste it back into the prompt, and then send it off to ChatGPT. In this case, in the prompt, so I actually did some prompt engineering. I actually went in and, and provided all this info about the tools. So I'm telling it, hey, there's these things called tools. You can invoke them like functions. This is how you're supposed to respond to a tool. It's very important that you respond in this way so that I can parse the output. And then I list all of the tools and give it the description, what the tool is used for, when to use it, when not to use it, et cetera, et cetera. And you can imagine a world where instead of just one tool here, I have 10 or even 50 tools. But if you think about it, the first part of this prompt really is not that different based on the user request. Like the tools themselves could be very different. So maybe you have tools that go out to Google Drive. Maybe you have tools that write to the file system. Maybe you have tools that call out to other LLMs. The, type of, the types of tools are basically limitless. But the structure, the way that we interact with the tools with ChatGPT is relatively similar. In fact, it is the same regardless of the type of tool that it's calling. As long as ChatGPT knows that tools are available, as long as it knows the descriptions of each tool, the arguments of each tool, and the type of responses that it's going to get from each tool, and as long as it knows how to actually invoke a tool, and as long as it knows how to read the response from a tool, it does not matter what those tools are. And so typing in this prompt over and over again is error prone. And it's also just repetitive. So what these API providers did, so what a company like OpenAI does is in their API, they actually provide a tool hook. So what you're able to do using the OpenAI API is you can provide a very structured list of these tools. And so it's gonna look functionally very similar to what I did here in prompt three. The only difference is that it's gonna be a lot more structured, a lot more formal. And OpenAI, they've trained their, their models to understand this tool calling extremely well. So what that means is they can basically guarantee that if the model is going to call a tool, it's going to behave correctly. It's going to listen to all of your instructions about the arguments, and it's going to output a JSON that you can use to then execute the tool in your program. And so what we can take a look at here, if you guys watched the video I, I put out last week about model context protocol transports, I actually took that code again. And what we're doing in this code is I've created a model context protocol client and I'm connecting it to the file system server. So the file system MCP server, you can find on GitHub, it's open source, very straightforward. And it provides a bunch of tools that allow the language model to do stuff with the file system. So we have move files, search files, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the actual tool definitions. And if we look here again, this is going to be very similar to what we were looking at in prompt three. It's a little more formalized, but we have the name of the tool, the description, and the input schema. And in this case, if we look over here, it is complicated by this Zod stuff, which is helping us 
define the types in TypeScript. But basically, this is telling us, okay, the tool schema for directory tree is going to include one argument. It's going to be called path, and it is going to be of type string. And so this is the same type of stuff, just a little more formalized. Nothing scary here. And regardless, what we, what we can do with an MCP client is list its tools. So we're going to run this script here in the debugger. If we take a look here, the response from the MCP server is going to be this tools array. And in here, we'll actually see every single thing that we saw here. Like that is the actual output of the list tools call. And then what we can do is convert those tools to a format that OpenAI, that OpenAI expects. And so in this case, we have the OpenAI tools variable. So I went ahead and converted everything because unfortunately model context protocol does not immediately plug into OpenAI, but it's pretty straightforward to get it to behave with the OpenAI spec. If we take a look here, the OpenAI tools array, again, it's going to have 11 elements because there's one tool per, per MCP tool. And if we click in here, we'll notice that we get this JavaScript object and it looks very similar, but what are we seeing? We're seeing the name, the description and the parameters. And so we can see here path of type string. And it's a very verbose and formalized way to communicate the exact same information that we were seeing in prompt three. And what's going to happen is in main.ts, if we look at the OpenAI chat completions API, uh, there is this tools, there is this tools argument and it is optional. And basically you provide this entire array of tools with their definitions, with their names and the descriptions. And then when you provide a request to ChatGPT, if it detects that it can use a tool, instead of just responding with an assistant message, it's going to respond with a tool call message. And so let's actually see what that looks like. So if we look here, the prompt that I'm sending is, can you list the files? And again, I'm giving it this directory. And if we go down here into the response, so response is the chat completion. Again, look down at my debugger here, we're seeing choices. And if we look here, the finished reason is actually tool calls. So now this is OpenAI telling us, hey, I actually invoked a tool and you need to respect that. If we go into message, there is this tool calls array that is optional. It doesn't need to be populated, but in this case, it is populated. If we look here, the tool call itself contains the arguments and the name of the tool. So again, if we go back to prompt three, this is more or less OpenAI, OpenAI automatically handling this response format problem. When we were doing it ourselves with prompt engineering, we had to specify all of this stuff in the prompt. But when we're using the OpenAI clients, this stuff is baked in. It's, it's happening seamlessly in the background. And so it's a lot friendlier to use. And if we look here, now we actually have the function call. And then so what we could do if we wanted to continue here is we would parse this JSON object, grab the path, and then find a way to call the list directories method, which if you're using MCP, you would do something like, you know, await uh, server dot, I think it would be clients dot, call tool and then you would give it the arguments there and so that's how you would actually go and invoke the tool one thing to note about the tool calls and, and how they relate to token usage is like we saw in prompt three when you are telling the model about the tools like if we actually copy this stuff and let's go over to the tokenizer the open ai tokenizer if we tokenize this stuff you'll notice that all of the tool descriptions and the system prompts and that kind of stuff is counting in the total number of tokens so there's all these tokens up here are coming from the tool calls, excuse me, the tool descriptions and the rules on how the model is supposed to actually invoke a tool. We can go in here and delete this stuff just to prove that. And the user request is only 30 or so tokens, but pasting the tool descriptions is going to use a bunch of, it is going to use up tokens. There's no way around that. Even with OpenAI's fancy tool calling API, all of this stuff is still taking up space in the context window. Admittedly, they probably are able to fine tune in some of the system instructions that it already knows about tools, but because your tool descriptions and your arguments are completely specific to your application, there's no way for that to be fine tuned. And so literally what OpenAI is pasting into the context window of the LLM on your behalf is a giant JSON object with all the tools and rules about how it's supposed to invoke those tools. So the implications of this are if you have a large number of tools, you will use a lot more tokens quickly. And a corollary of this is if you have too many tools, the accuracy of the model is going to start to go down. Models have a context window limit. They cannot process an infinite amount of text. Not only can they not process an infinite amount of text, but as you start to use up more and more of the context window, so if you're using half of it, if you're using 75% of it, models start to get amnesia, particularly about what was said at the beginning of the context window. And so if you have a list of, let's say 100 tools, the model is going to start to get very confused and it's probably not going to do a good job of calling the right tools. And it's probably even going to start to make simple mistakes on formatting, invoking stuff.
as much as possible, you only want to include tools that might be relevant for the request. And if you have different groups of tools that serve completely different purposes, or worse, have some overlap and can kind of conflict together, you probably do not want to include them all in your prompt because that's going to confuse the model and it's not going to be able to handle all of that context. Also, if you're using a lot of tool, if you're using a lot of tools, that's going to increase the cost of your API calls because the number of tokens used in each prompt is going to increase significantly. In fact, it's going to increase linearly, linearly with the number of tools and the length of your descriptions and the length of your argument lists. This is a very fundamental concept, like I mentioned at the beginning of video, in dealing with agents. And this is really the backbone of how MCP works, especially if you used Claude Desktop and hooked up an MCP server into it. Basically, what you're doing is installing your own custom tool definitions into an already existing LLM application. And that's the power of MCP. All right, I'm going to end the video there. Please leave a comment down below if you thought the video was helpful. I'll catch you guys next time.